when you when you start to peel back the way that modern medicine defines a lot of conditions that we have, you know, take um, depression or anxiety or ADD or ADHD, because a lot of your listeners are probably entrepreneurs, and a lot of entrepreneurs have very active minds, and they've been told they have attention deficit disorder, right, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Well, an attention deficit disorder is not an attention deficit at all. Um, we misdefine these things. It's an attention overload disorder, because you see, in the human brain, we don't just create thought. We also dismantle thought. It is just as important for you to be able to create a new thought or feeling as it is to dismantle it, right? And if you don't degrade thought, called catecholamines, if you don't degrade them, then there's a gene that governs this, catechol o methyltransferase If you create thought at a faster rate than you degrade thought, then the mind gets very clouded. And so attention deficit disorder is attention overload disorder. It's too many windows open at the same time. So modern medicine says, well, if the mind's racing, let's put an amphetamine into the body, race the central nervous system to match the pace of the mind. And this is a very poor choice, right? Because eventually this will burn you out, it can actually change the neuroplasticity of the brain. Rather than put the right amino acids back into the body, the right B-complex blend, um, the right methylated folates, so that the mind can actually begin to quiet. What would you say to someone that says that ADHD is also in some ways a result of some early trauma? Well, you know, trauma is always fascinating to me. Trauma can trigger methylation. Trauma can interrupt the methylation cycle, right? But the, the idea in modern medicine that you have some kind of trauma, you have a disrupted relationship with your mother, for example, and that somehow we're going to go and put neuroplasticity altering chemicals into the brain. It's going to fix this 30 year broken relationship you have with your mother. To me, it doesn't. Yeah, 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 make any sense, yeah. right? And so it's not at all to poo-poo trauma, to, to, to put trauma down. Depression really exists, anxiety really exists. But, but if you actually look at how we define these conditions, take depression, for example, we define depression, at least in America, we define depression as an inadequate supply of serotonin, right? So if you are low in serotonin, you're by definition depressed. So then you would think that the solution would be to raise serotonin. Right? If we define depression as low serotonin, you'd think that the solution would be to raise serotonin, but that's not what we do. We take people that are depressed and we put them on SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what these do is they ration what little serotonin these people have. So by definition, it never raises serotonin. So by definition, it never ends depression. I mean, I have, I have clients come in to see me all the time and, and, and in our clinical team, and then I'll say, well, how long have you been on antidepressants? And they say, 15 years, 18 years. Yeah, my first question is, well, when did you think it was going to kick in, right? So if we understand that serotonin is actually methylated in the gut, this process that I'm talking about is called methylation. We actually make serotonin from an amino acid called tryptophan, the one that's famous for making you sleepy after Thanksgiving dinner. I know you guys don't have Thanksgiving in the UK, but I'm from America. But um, so because we eat a lot of turkey on Thanksgiving and turkey has a lot of tryptophan. So when you take... Um, tryptophan, methylate it into the neurotransmitter serotonin, of which 90% resides in your gut. Methylate is basically processing. Yeah, the processing. It's like the right. refining process. Crude oil gets refined into gasoline. Amino acids get methylated into neurotransmitters. Okay. And so <clears throat> this process of methylation, when it's broken, and, and it can be relatively easy to fix, when it's broken, it means that we have an impaired ability to create, we have an impaired ability to um, refine a raw material and it leads to this deficit. Well, serotonin, for example, 90% of it resides in your gut. So if you don't have it here, you can't have it here. So depression rarely begins in the outside environment. It usually begins in the gut. Now it may be trauma that led to the deficiency, but the fix is not in a chemical or synthetic or pharmaceutical blocking the brain's capacity to uptake these neurotransmitters. The fix is in restoring adequate levels to the body so it can naturopathically make its way back up the vagus nerve and, and arrive to the brain. Sim similar things are true with anxiety. I mean, if you actually have ever suffered from or know somebody who suffered from anxiety, if you ask them three questions, you can find out very quickly that their anxiety is not coming from a cluster of symptoms. It's not coming from their outside environment. It is coming from within them. It's coming from their physiology, right? I mean, if you know someone who suffered from anxiety and you say, well, have you had anxiety on and off throughout your lifetime? The most of the time they'll say yes. And then if you say, can you point to the specific trigger that causes it? Very often they'll say no. 
Um, I mean, yes, I know some of my triggers, but I could be sitting in a podcast just like this in a very calm environment. There's no threats around. And all of a sudden I get overwhelmed by anxiety. I can be driving home from work on an otherwise innocuous day and I can be overwhelmed by anxiety. Well, that is not coming from your outside environment, right? This is coming from a process called methylation and it is caused from excess catecholamines entering the brain and an inability to downregulate these. So the body's entering this mild fight or flight response without the presence of a fear. See, remember that as sophisticated as we like to think our brains are, it's really not. Our brain is very primal. You know what the brain cares about? The brain cares about survival. And so it doesn't care how fat or skinny you are, how pretty or ugly you are. It doesn't care about your skin, your hair. It cares about survival. And so when we understand that the brain does not know the difference between perception and reality, we start to understand how it can play tricks on us. Mm. So I always use the example that, let's say you drove home tonight and you got out of your car. When you got home, you got out of your car and somebody was standing in front of you with a knife. It's a very real threat, right? You'd have a fight or flight response. Your pupils would dilate, your heart rate would increase, your extremities would flood with blood, your hearing would get very acute, your brain would flood with catecholamines, you are getting ready to fight or flight. But you could also be laying on the 30th floor of a condo building in bed and start thinking about getting eaten by a shark. There is zero chance of a shark getting out of the ocean, going up a 30th floor elevator, mm. right? Coming into your condo and biting you in that bed. But you can have the exact same response. If you're watching a movie or something. Exactly, so one is entirely real, one is entirely perceived. The physiologic response is identical. So now once we understand this, now we begin to understand how I can feel the presence of a fear, which is what anxiety is. It's a fear of something happening in the future. Usually it's not going to happen, usually hasn't happened in the past, and is not likely to happen. But it's, it's this fear starts to build up. You start to get very anxious. It can actually change your heart rate um, to the point where you can panic attacks can land you in a hospital. Um, or it can be mild enough that it just causes you anxiousness and mild anxiety. But there's no presence of a fear. And so you start trying to correlate it to your outside environment, it starts to drive you crazy because you go, well, I don't get it. I'm on vacation with my wife and my, or my spouse and my kids and I'm in the resort of a lifetime. I've been here a thousand times. I love this place. There's no reason I should feel like this. But all of a sudden you have this feeling of anxiousness, anxiety. So these are, these are lack of raw material in the human body. My mission is to try to help people by taking a genetic test um, once in their lifetime find out where is methylation broken and then stop supplementing just for the sake of supplementing and start supplementing for this deficiency so your body can thrive in the case of people that are listening to this now and they can pinpoint the moments where they've gotten anxiety so they say they've i remember i had one guest on the podcast maybe two years ago and after he became famous he developed social anxiety mm -hmm. so he whenever he would be with around a lot of people he'd feel that sense of anxiety and then from that sort of catalytic moment, then when he's at home, he'd get the same rush of anxiety, but he would point to that catalytic moment of becoming famous and then some things had happened in his life and then he'd get anxiety at home when nothing was going on. Right. In that situation, what's the... the so there you go. So, so now you've, you've, you've interrupted methylation because there's one where there's the presence of fear and there's one where there isn't, there's the absence of a fear. So to be very specific, anxiety, true anxiety does exist, but you can point to the specific trigger that causes it. So for example, if you if you have a fear of heights and you walk to the edge of a 30th floor balcony and look over it, you're gonna feel anxiety. Yeah. If you're claustrophobic and you step on a really crowded elevator, you're gonna feel anxiety. But if you're claustrophobic and you're sitting at home and you start to become overwhelmed with anxiety, yeah. this is actually not coming from that trigger. This is coming from your physiology. And the way that we deal with stress, right? And like cortisol, when you measure cortisol levels, cortisol is not really a measure of how much stress is in your life. It's a measure of your body's reaction to stress. So why are some people more resilient to stress and don't have anxiety attacks? And why are other people not as resistant? Again, this is not to say that if you didn't have you know, a violent attack in your life or, or a terrible car accident, that sometimes when you've had a, you know, a, a vehicle accident, you approach an intersection, the, 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 re, the memory of having been T-boned, mm -hmm. you know, recently and badly injured is going to give you anxiety. But the majority of people are not suffering from that type of hyper-specific situational anxiety. They're suffering from something called generalized anxiety or idiopathic anxiety, which means of unknown origin. So for somebody who's very famous and gets into a, 
a crowd and doesn't know who's coming at them. That's a very, I wouldn't even define that as anxiety. That's a very primal instinctual reaction to a real fear, mm. right? Just like walking to the edge of a 30th floor balcony. What's not a primal reaction to a real fear is when there is no presence of a fear, especially if that incident has never happened and you aren't even sure what you are afraid of or why you are anxious or why you have anxiety, then this is coming from your physiology. So how would you treat that? You'd look at the different, uh, there, there are five major actionable genes that I like to look at in their, what's it called, their suballeles. And when you find out what they're deficient in, you start to supplement with things like SAMe, s adenosylmethionine, um, methylated forms of vitamins, L-methionine, the, the proper balance of B-complex, um, methylated forms of folic acid or folate called methylfolate. And what happens is now the body has the capacity to degrade these neurotransmitters that are causing this fight or flight. This group of neurotransmitters called catecholamines and the anxiousness that follows. And you'll find that the majority of people that suffer from idiopathic anxiety or generalized anxiety because of low serotonin, they also have gut issues. Um, you show me a person that's truly depressed and I'll show you somebody that's also suffering from severe gut issues, either gas or bloating or diarrhea, constipation, irritability, cramping, because the same neurotransmitters that affect these emotional states also are responsible for the motility of the gut, the speed of the gut.